New genes are essential. Genes are traditionally thought to be created by duplication of other genes and then divergence of one or both copies for the simple reason that uh, it is very hard to create genes all from scratch. However, there's some new information that challenges this scenario. And um, sometimes what is said, unsaid in the article can be as important as what is said. Uh, we're going to start with a uh, good summary in Science Daily of an article that is available on the internet. Um, I made it into science. Um, and then uh, another summary, just uh, kind of glancing over it, and then a few more articles, and, uh, and we'll try to wrap up. The uh, summary is found in Science Daily. It's known as the New Genes Spring Spread from Non-Coding DNA. And uh, kind of the summary, as you can see, is uh, where do new genes come from is a long-standing question in genetics and evolutionary biology. A new study shows that new genes can spring from non-coding DNA more readily than expected. Um, that last sentence probably needs to be unpacked. What it means is they found stuff there that uh, looks like it had to have come from non-coding DNA. Um, and it doesn't look like it took millions of years. So it must have been easy if it was done. Which of course doesn't necessarily follow. Where do new genes come from is a long-standing question in, in genetics and evolutionary biology. A new study from researchers at the University of California, Davis, published in January 23 in Science Express, shows that new genes are created from non-coding DNA more rapidly than expected. This shows very clearly that genes are being born from ancestral sequences all the time, said David Bagan, professor of um, evolution and ecology at UC Davis and senior author on the paper. Geneticists have long puzzled about how completely new genes appear. In a well-known model proposed by Nobel laureate Susuna Ono, uh, who uh, usually gets credit for the term uh, junk DNA. New functions appear when existing genes are duplicated and then diverge in function. Uh, Began's laboratory discovered a few years ago that new genes could also appear from previously non-coding stretches of DNA. And similar effects have since been discovered in other animals and plants. Think of the difficulty of trying to create a new gene from more or less random DNA. This is the first example of totally new genes still spreading through a species, said Li Zhao, postdoctoral researcher at UC Davis and the first author, author on the paper. Zhao looked at RNA transcripts in several wild-derived strains. I'm not going to read the it, word for word, but you can uh, see what I've skipped. It's not that much. Um, <coughs> of the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster and compared them to transcripts expressed in the standard reference sequence strain of uh, D. melanogaster and in two closely related species. She found 248 new genes. Now, this is not a one-off phenomenon that exist only in D. melanogaster, just over 100 of which were fixed or already spread throughout the population. In other words, There are about 148, more or less, new genes that are still in equilibrium with uh, another, with apparently no gene. Think about how you do that. These genes emerged from ancestrally non-coding DNA since D. melanogaster is split from its close relative D. simulans. In other words, some of these genes, about 100 of which were fixed, are found in all D. melanogaster, but not found in D. simulants. Um, 
The new genes showed evidence of being under selection, meaning that they were spreading through the population as flies carrying them gained an edge in reproduction. They fell into two broad classes. Genes found at high frequency tended to be larger and more complex and therefore likely had more significant functions than those found at low frequency. Zhao said that it is possible that these new genes form when a random mutation in the regulatory ma machinery causes a piece of non-coding DNA to be transcribed to RNA. If it, had a, if it has a beneficial effect, then it gets selected, she said. It's difficult to say at this point how important this phenomenon is for generating new genetic material, Zhao said. Remember we have talked earlier about uh, the difficulty of selecting positively uh, uh, various genes and it raises the question of how whether this is being selected positively or whether this is actually degenerating the other way. The above is based on materials provided by the University of California at Davis and the references origin and spread of de novo genes in Drosophila melanogaster gaster populations found in science. Now, science doesn't have it online, but HHS Public Access does have the article. Apparently, with some editing, which is not clear exactly how much, uh, in science. The uh, abstract of the uh, of the available, uh, freely available manuscript starts. Uh, comparative genomic analysis have revealed the genes may arise from ancestral non-genic sequence. However, the origin and spread of these de novo genes within populations remains obscure. We identified 142 segregating and 106 fixed testis expressed de novo genes in a population sample of Drosophila melanogaster. These genes appear to derive primarily from ancestral intergenic unexpressed open reading frames sometimes with the open reading frame extended by a mutation, with natural selection playing a significant role in their spread. These results reveal a heretofore unappreciated dynamism of gene content. Genes are changing all the time. The beginning of the article states, although the vast majority of genes pre present in any species descend from a gene present in an ancestor, recent analyses suggest that some, of, some genes originate from ancestrally non-genic sequences. Notice they're not alone in this. There's three references that they give. Evidence for these de novo genes has generally derived from a combination of phylogenetic and genomic transcri transcriptomic analysis that reveal evidence of lineage or species-specific transcripts associated with non-genic orthologous sequences in sister species. Now, there's something that looks like junk in one species that turns out to be a gene in another. De novo genes, uh, by the way, doesn't that sound like pseudogenes? Genes that used to have a function but no longer do, in which case it suggests that the transcribed ones are the original. Now we're talking real heresy. De novo genes, which were first identified in Drosophila, have also been identified in human, rodents, rice, and yeast. Why it isn't humans, I don't know. Um, <coughs> so we've got a whole bunch of genes in everything, basically, everything that's been looked at thoroughly. In Drosophila, de novo genes tend to be specifically expressed in tissues associated with male reproduction, suggesting that sexual comedic suggestion selection may be important, though other functional roles may evolve. There's an even more interesting theory on that, uh, which we may get to. Because previous studies of gen de novo gene evolution used, to compare, used comparative rather than population genetic approaches, the earliest steps in de novo gene origination remain mysterious. Here we use population genomic and transcriptomic data from Drosophila melanogaster and its close relatives to investigate the origin and spread of de novo genes within populations. Um, basically, with the, to translate that, what we say is there's the standard D. melanogaster genome, but it turns out that not all fruit flies have that. 
And so they're looking not only at variation between the standard D. melanogaster and the standard D. whatever else, but also they're looking at the uh, uh, difference between different populations of D. melanogaster. Illumina paired and RNA sequencing and de novo and reference guided approaches were used to characterize the testis transcriptome of six previously selected sequenced inbred Raleigh D. melanogaster strains, apparently standard uh, D. melanogaster, sort of like Sprague Dolly rats or something like that, um, just a standard breed. An average of 65 million paired end reads were produced for each strain. We inferred the presence of 142 polymorphic de novo candidate genes expressed in at least one RAL strain, but which are not known based on publicly available data from D. melanogaster. So it's not in the standard genome, but it is in at least one of these strains. The median number of segregating de novo genes carried per strain was 49. So each strain has 50 unique genes of its own, more or less. The candidate genes exp exhibited expression neither in testis RNA sequence data from three D, D simulans and two D Jacoba strains. So there's two other strains of fruit flies that are closely related to D. melanogaster that don't have these genes nor in whole male and female RNA sequence data from 59D simulan strains. And those should all be italicized and I omitted to do so. None of the candidates showed significant expression in whole females from the same D. melanogaster strains used for testis RNA sequence. Several attributes of these genes support the hypothesis that the observed transcripts are biologically meaningful. And uh, we'll see some papers that um, argue that pretty strongly. I'm just kind of going to summarize the next little bit uh, on my own, which is that the splicing uh, for these new genes was similar to that of other genes, except that the long open reading frames were overrepresented in the new genes. Segregating de novo genes were either expressed at a relatively high level in expressing strains or showed almost no evidence of expression of other, in other strains. Because no candidates show expression in the reference sequence strain, the genes expressed in all six RAL strains are considered to be polymorphic in the species. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. This isn't different alleles of the same gene. This is genes that have been turned into pseudogenes in the reference strain, but are found in these other strains as actual um, actual genes, coding for protein, etc. However, gene ontology enrichment analysis provided no insight into the possible function of de novo genes. Notice the predictive power of evolution. And to, uh, I'm going to get the next paragraph and then we'll finish the article. Um, um, well, one population genetic explanation for polymorphic de novo genes is that singleton genes, that is 45% of genes, are primarily deleterious and the higher frequency genes are primarily neutral. Genes that are there producing protein but it doesn't matter If the deleterious nature of de novo genes were due to the cost of transcription or translation or from toxic interactions of the resulting RNAs or proteins with other molecules, then lower frequency genes should be more abundantly expressed and, and longer than higher frequency genes. So that's the hypothesis. Con however, contrary to this expectation, lower frequency genes were expressed at a lower level, were shorter and le less complex than higher frequency genes. The different properties of rare versus common de novo genes supports the idea that de novo genes have having certain properties. 
are more likely to spread under selection. So if you kind of approach it from a standard evolutionary perspective, you'd make a hypothesis. Turns out the hypothesis is wrong. And um, now to look over a few paragraphs of um, The Scientist, which is uh, talking about the same article. Uh, it's very interesting because they interview p other people who are not involved in the research. Uh, quote, until recently, de novo origin of genes was considered to be so unlikely as to be impossible. Comparative geno uh, genomicist Aoife McLeisop of the Smurfit Institute of Genetics at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, who is not involved in the study, told the scientist in an email. This population level analysis is important because it gives a new insight into the very early stages of the origin and establishment of genes de novo. Look at that first line. Until recently, de novo origins of genes was considered to be so likely as to be unlikely as to be impossible. But there they are, so it must happen. To show the formation of de novo genes at the population genetic level, it's really a nice story, agreed evolutionary biologist uh, Dieter Tauts of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology in Plon, Germany, uh, who also did not participate in the research. It shows the power of generating from nothing, so to speak. Creation ex nihilo. And uh, skipping on, looking more closely at these transcripts, the researchers found evidence that the majority of the de novo gene candidates were subject to cis regulation, meaning that expression was controlled by regulatory elements just upstream of the new transcripts. Furthermore, the vast majority of the sequences contain open reading frames regions that could theoretically produce proteins, as signified by star and stop codon sequences of at least 150 base pairs. And looking at the ancestral sequences as well as the sequences of the non-expressing Drosophila strains, the researchers found these same ORFs suggesting that the regulatory change alone is responsible for the expression of the new gene. So the only difference between the old gene and the new gene is that the Cis regulatory uh, a portion is activated. That means that genes apparently are just sitting around there doing nothing, and then all of a sudden the regulatory mechanism kicks in, and now they're now they're working just fine. How do you keep that going? I think I remember Dan Grauer arguing that you couldn't keep that alive for millions of years without it deteriorating. I think he's right about that. Of course, maybe there haven't been millions of years, but that's, uh, that's a different hypothesis. If you start thinking in terms of degeneration, you can go into an entirely different scenario here. Yes, that's right. If it's degeneration instead of instead of getting better and suddenly popping up into space, then what happens is the gene's fine, you knock out the regulatory system and it doesn't work anymore. Pardon? This. That's right, the organisms are able to survive in spite of this. Apparently Fruit flies are put together with a lot of um, redundancy, shall we say? Well, that's true with humans, too. I mean, uh, genetic diseases, there are plenty of them that people have that they don't die from immediately. Whether these sequences are translated into proteins or otherwise functional remains to be seen. So they're finding the RNA. They don't even know whether it's actually translated <laughs> yet. So this is, uh, the research is A, that new, and B, they're, they're that confident in spite of the fact that they haven't found the protein that they're actually doing something. And of course, 
not all ge new genes are likely to be beneficial. On who's reading? In fact, theory would predict that the majority are actually harmful. Most, most mutations are deleterious. Where have we heard that before? Uh, in, uh, but the idea that new genes are rising at such high frequencies would certainly, I think that should be, give natural selection plenty of raw material to work with. Though many questions remain, the study represented yet another advance in scientists' understanding of a phenomenon that only a few years ago was thought impossible, said Touts. There's been a long tradition in biology to think that a gene can only arise due to duplication and diversions from another gene. And this is therefore a completely new story. It's quite an exciting field. Creation of genes ex nihilo. But it turns out that these are not all, at least, genes that are inconsequential. They're not neutral. They're not even deleterious. At least a good share of them are, in fact, advantageous. In an article in PLOS Genetics, de novo orfs uh, in Drosophila are important to organismal fitness and evolve rapidly. Um, you'll notice that Bagan and Jones and Salo who were the last three authors of the last, the last paper we were talking about, are the last three authors of this paper as well, so it obviously comes from the same group. Um, <coughs> how non-coding DNA gives rise to new protein-coding genes, de novo genes, is not well understood, I would guess. Recent work has revealed the origins and functions of a few de novo genes, but common principles governing the evolution or biological roles of these genes are unknown. To better define these principles, we performed a parallel analysis of the evolution and function of six putatively protein-coding de novo genes described in Drosophila melanogaster. Now, so what they're, what they're doing is they're going to see if six of the, remember we were talking about, what, 250, something like that, genes earlier. We're going to only look at six of them. Um, Reconstruction of the transcript, uh, transcriptional history of de novo genes so that the two de novo genes emerged from novel long, long non-coding RNAs that rose at least five million years prior to evolution of an open reading frame. In contrast, four other de novo genes evolved a translated open reading frame and transcription within the same evolutionary interval, suggesting that nascent open reading frames, proto-ORFs, while not required, can contribute to the emergence of a new de novo gene. However, none of the genes arose from proto-ORFs that existed long before expression evolved. So not only are we creating new genes, we are also creating new stretches of DNA, at least if you believe the standard scenario. Sequence and structural evolution of de novo genes is rapid compared to nearby genes, and the structural complexity of de novo genes steadily increases over the evolutionary time. Despite the fact that these genes are transcribed at a higher level in males and in females and are most strongly expressed in testes, which is why they usually look for it there, RNAi experiments, that's inhibitory RNA, show that most of these genes are essential in both sexes during metamorphosis. This lethality suggests that protein-coding de novo genes in Drosophila quickly become functionally important. The flies can't do without them. Uh, most, the, the starting at the beginning, uh, most new genes arise from the duplication or rearrangement in whole and part of existing genes. These new genes are typically structurally and functionally similar to their progenitors. In contrast, protein coding genes may also evolve de novo from previous, no, previously non-coding sequences, making them lineage specific and unlikely. Uh, pardon me, and unlike any existing protein. De novo genes were once thought to be vanishingly rare or even impossible. Subsequent work suggests instead that these brand new genes <coughs> make up a significant portion of novel genes and some have important functions. 
So we used to think you couldn't do this. We now know not only can you do this, it happens all the time, but these become important. Skipping through the article, uh, we next mined the EBI Pride proteomic database for evidence that X and ORFs were translated. Four of the six de novo genes, all but the newest ORFs, expressed peptides in earlier embryos. So in embryos, they show up. They're translated. Uh, RNAi of D. melanogaster de novo genes affects viability in male fertility. The consistency of testis biased expressions of genes across species led us to hypothesis that these genes may function primarily as male fertility genes. Contrary to our expectation, oops, we were wrong. We found that RNAi knockdown of the four de novo genes we were able to assay strongly affected viability. Lethality occurred in all four cases at the late ferrate adult stage just prior to eclosion. Um, the ferrate stage is where the, you have the exoskeleton and they're ready to just pop out of the, uh, out of the pupa in this particular case. But as they go to pop out, they, they die at that point. So apparently it has something to do with uh, going from a pupa to an adult. Our observation of ferrate stage lethality is consistent with previous work. Uh, we're not the only ones. Showing RNA of CG31406 leads to ferrate stage death. Skipping along, and you can see um, some of the genes that they were assaying. And here is, apparently there's quite a drop off of, uh, a lot of pupas never make it. You know, 112 to 53, you lose about 50%, but you'll notice that on the red ones, when you put the RNA inhibitor um, you wind up killing the whole bunch off, not just half of them. Of the five melanogaster de novo genes we investigated in an RNAi screen, four RNAi li lines resulted in lethality in our assay. Three led to skewed sex ratios in adults and most, most likely due to sex differentiated differential survival, and one showed an altered male reproductive fitness which is probably the one that, didn't, that did manage to survive. Though this case may be a side effect of the reduced male viability in the same cross. In short, de novo genes are consistently evolutionary and biologically essential. They're not just out there doing nothing. In contrast, the origin of these genes are divergent. Some de novo genes clearly began as de novo long RNAs, while others may have emerged from a proto-ORF, although it is clear that a proto-ORF is not required for their evolution. And interestingly enough, the proto-ORF doesn't go back very far, in some cases at least. After they arose, de novo gene sequence and structure invariably evolved rapidly. That means you can't tell where they came from very easily. However, we did not detect significant signatures of recent positive selection, but this may be due to problems with power in the data, particularly the low level of polymorphism. Earlier work suggested positive selection had acted on some of these genes. Some of them are actually doing something worthwhile. RNAi knockdown caused lethality in four or five de novo genes tested, a surprising finding because these genes are very young. If these genes are essential, what function are they performing now that was apparently non, not needed by the ancestor? Unless maybe the ancestor was more complex. But that would of course go against evolutionary theory. The lethality consistently occurred during late ferrate adult sages, pre-closed adults, after full eye pigmentation and the appearance of bristles had begun. 
It is impossible to completely rule out effects of RNAi on off targets that have, for example, very weak sequence similarity to the double-stranded RNA. So extending this work using genetic mutants is a logical next step. They're not done, and I agree with them that I think that um, looking at genetic mutants is a logical next step, partly because um, you always worry that what you've put on them is actually poison generalized in and of itself. Skipping way past most of the uh, article, actually finish that, finishing up the article and then looking at um, uh, uh, an, uh, another article in Science that has basically the same, and just for the uh, record, that's the uh, uh, reference in the, in the, uh, on the internet. Um, to investigate the origin and evolution of essential genes, we identified and phenotyped 195 young protein coding genes, which originated 3 to 35 million years ago in Drosophila. Knocking down expression with RNA interference showed that 30% of newly arised, arisen genes are essential for viability. The proportion of genes that are essential is similar in every evolutionary age group that we examined, whether it be for general Drosophila, whether it be for certain aspects of Drosophila, whether it be for subtypes. It's just fascinating. A third of them are absolutely necessary. Under constitutive silencing of these young essential genes, lethality was high in the pupil stage and also found in the larval stages. Lethality was attributed to diverse cellular and developmental defects, such as organ formation and patterning defects. These data suggest that the new genes frequently and rapidly evolve essential functions and participate in development. Behold the power of evolution. Going into the article, to the second paragraph, by a comparative genomic analysis of 12 closely related Drosophila genes, species, we identified 566 new genes in the DML and Agaster genome and dated their evolutionary ages through phylogenetic distributions. We're talking 500 genes. All these genes originated less than 35 million years after the divergence from D. Willistoni, so we call them young genes. Now, the, all these genes originated less than 35 million years, of course, is a theory-laden statement. And what it means in practice is the D. Willistoni does not have those genes. But some other Drosophila, including Melanogaster, has those genes. Unexpectedly, I mean, we keep running into this word, 59 of these genes were lethal under constitutive RNA knockdown. We found that essential genes emerged throughout an evolutionary period examined. The youngest, P24 related to, arose within the last three million years and is thus D. melanogaster specific, table S2. In each gr age group, the proportion of genes that are essential is around 30%, suggesting that whether or not a gene is essential is independent of its age. A new and duplicate gene can quickly evolve a novel and an important function by accumulating advantageous mutations. More precisely, we can find advantageous mutations or perhaps we can find deleterious mutations if you're looking at it from the other end. Especially, of course, evolution requires you to look at it from the end that they're advantageous. Especially in the species with large effective population sizes such as Drosophila. And uh, <clears throat> now we're going to look at um, Helen Pilcher's article all alone. This comes from Harvard. And uh, there's the website if you're interested. Um, but where do they, as she, previous paragraph she mentions orphan genes, come from? 
With no obvious ancestry, it was as if these genes had appeared from nowhere, but that couldn't be true. Everyone assumed that as we have learned more, we would discover what had happened to their families, but we haven't. Quite the opposite, in fact. Ever since we discovered genes, biologists have been pondering their origin. At the dawn of life, the very first genes must have been thrown up by chance. Must have been. What else was there? But life almost certainly began in an RNA world. So back then, genes weren't just blueprints for making enzymes that guided chemical reactions. They themselves were the enzymes. If random processes threw up a piece of RNA that could help make more copies of itself, and presumably do something else as well, natural selection would have kicked in straight away. Well, that's assuming that you have plenty of raw materials for RNA, but we'll go over that small difficulty. Notice, I mean, that this is a true believer. Uh, she is not writing this to shoot down um, evolutionary theory. The upshot is that the chances of random mutations turning a bit of junk DNA into a new gene seem infinitesimally small. As the French biologist Francois Jacob, I guess, uh, famously wrote 35 years ago, the probability that a functional protein would appear de novo by random association of amino acids is practically zero. Yeah, it is. And skipping on, take the light sensing pigments known as opsins. The various opsins in our eyes are not just related to each other, they are also related to the opsins found in all other animals from jellyfish to insects. The thousands of different opsin genes found across the animal kingdom all evolved by duplication, starting with a single gene in a common ancestor living around 700 million years ago. At least that's the story. It has to be the story because they're too similar to each other. They couldn't have evolved separately. Well now, now that we know the genes can evolve from nothing, couldn't they have evolved separately? Don't ask that question. Most genes belong to similar families and their ancestry can be traced back many millions of years. But when the gene, yeast geno genome was sequenced around 15 years ago, it was discovered that around a third of yeast genes appeared to have no family. The term orphans, sometimes spelled orphans, was used to describe individual genes or small groups of very similar genes with no known relatives. Skipping on a little further, so many orphans. A third of the genome in the yeast is orphans. But as the genomes of more and more organisms were sequenced, genetic family reunions proved to be the exception rather than the rule. Orphan genes have since been found in every genome sequence to date, from mosquito to man, roundworm to rat, and their numbers are still growing. In corals, jellyfish, and polyps, orphan genes guide the development of explosive stinging cells, sophisticated structures that launch toxin-filled capsules to stun prey. And of course, only jellyfish have those. In the freshwater polyp hydra, Orphans guide the development of feeding tentacles around the organism's mouth. And the polar cod's orphan antifreeze gene enables it to survive in the life in the icy Arctic. That's one that actually could theoretically have evolved uh, by simple uh, mutations that get better all the time. Curiously, orphan genes are often expressed in the testes and in the brain. Lately, some have even dared speculate that orphan genes have contributed to the evolution of the biggest innovation of all, the human brain. In 2011, Long and his colleagues identified 198 orphan genes in humans, chimpanzees, and orangutans that are expressed in the prefrontal cortex, the region of the brain associated with advanced cognitive abilities. Of these, 54 were specific to humans. We've got over 50 unique genes in our brains. We're going to come back to that in a, at the end. But where do they come from? In 2003, Touts and a colleague suggested that orphan genes are formed by duplication, but then evolve so rapidly that any similarity to the original is obliterated. The dog consistently eats the homework. 
And they did have evidence that seemed to support this idea. They showed that orphans in fruit flies evolved three times more quickly than non-orphans. Orphan genes were thus crowbarred into the old model of genes arising by duplication. Uh, that doesn't sound like a nice, neat fit, does it? Later studies, however, suggest that this can only explain the origin of a minority of orphans. So while the process is clearly important, it's not the whole story. The idea seemed reasonable at the time, said Touts, because uh, the alternative seemed so unlikely. What's the alternative? The alternative? The only other possibility was that genes really can evolve from scratch. Or, um, dare we say, be created from scratch. From random stretches of non-coding DNA, or in some cases, not even that. This is the idea long dismissed as completely implausible because the leap from non-coding DNA to a gene with a useful protein product was considered so huge as to be impossible. But nature hasn't read the textbooks. And then maybe nature's God hasn't either. Or he's laughing at them. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if orphan genes turn out to have regulatory functions, said Tomka. Or, uh, pardon me, Tampa. Uh, perhaps this helps explain why orphan genes can become essential very quickly. In 2010, Long's team used RNA interference to switch off evolutionarily old and new genes in fruit flies. They found the new genes, including orphans, were just as likely to be essential for life as old genes. And if you're wondering what that reference is, it's the one we were just talking about. We still have to, a lot to learn about orphan genes, but we are now starting to trace their ancestry. And it looks as if we couldn't find the, familiar, the families of most orphans because they don't really have families. They don't, they just spring de novo. Genes ex nihilo. The raw DNA from which they sprung can be traced, but as genes, they are the first of their kind. In the sense, the term orphans may be a misnomer. Perhaps they ought to be renab renamed Pinocchio genes. Non-genes carved by chance and natural selection into proper living genes. I love that last line. Now, interestingly enough, Neanderthals had our de novo genes. At least according to BioArchive. And if you're wanting to find it, it's uh, on the internet. There's the address. For CLUU1, the enabler mutation is a single base adenine de deletion, or delta A. Del A, probably. This derived mutation, not present in chimp, gorilla, gibbon, or macaque, was also present in the Altai Neanderthal. There was one difference between Neanderthal and human CLU1 sequences. The amino acid at position 110, lysine K, is encoded by AAG in Neanderthal and by AAA in human. And we'll probably find some humans that have AAG instead. But that's just predicting from... Surprisingly, the Denis Denisovan did not p possess the enabler delta A, or del A. So there's apparently one gene where humans and Neanderthals share a deletion which makes the gene work. And the Denisovan doesn't have that, nor do the chimp, gorilla, gibbon, or macaque. Neanderthals and Denis uh, Denisovans appear to have functional DNA H. 10 OS and C22 ORF45 genes. At the DNA H10 OS locus, both species possess the enabling 10 base pair insertion and neither have mutations that disrupt the ORF, although they did share two derived substitutions. That is to say, 
there are two substitutions in Neanderthals and Denisovans that are not present in humans. One, they had a synonymous third position T to G substitution in codon 23, CCG in Neanderthal and Denisovan, CCT in human, and a non-synonymous G to A substitution in codon 153. AGT in Neanderthal and Denisovan, and GGT in human. The second change caused a glycine to serine amino acid substitution. The human and Neanderthal and Denisovan C22ORF45 gene sequences were identical. Remember, these are orphan genes, which means that they're not found in other primates. So humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans apparently all have very similar sequences in particular orphan genes, suggesting that maybe Neanderthals and Denisovans were essentially human. Now, my take on all this is I think this is another case where the math obviously doesn't work out. And everybody's known it for a long time. But evolutionists just have to discard their predictions because, as they put it, nature hasn't read the textbooks. It illustrates the unfalsifiable nature of evolutionary theory. You have this kind of stuff. It shouldn't work. It does. Maybe there's something wrong with evolution. No, it couldn't be that. It's got to be uh, that, we, that these genes are more easily to create than we previously thought. Because they're created. A theory of genetic degeneration would seem to fit the facts, at least as well, maybe better. The last article contains data that makes a good argument for De Neanderthals and Denisovans being essentially human. In the case of CLUU1, one can make a case that Denisovans may be hybrids containing at least one ape-like pseudogene. Maybe it's a spontaneous mutation, I suppose. The alternative is to say that the Delta A addition, which is what I think actually happened, that we were created with that, and the apes were created deliberately without it, is at a hot spot, which is easy to make a mistake on and so the Denisovan degenerated there. But that's how I see things. Now it's your turn. Can I ask a question for clarification? Sure. Uh, go ahead, it'll it'll come on the in just a minute. By def I the definition of a gene is that it produces a RNA producing sequence, uh, protein producing sequence. Is that because it looks like you start with the RNA and then they say then the gene is there because the RNA is there. And if I was trying to follow that, if that's the case, why isn't the theory that they simply have the same genetic pool and the regulatory turns on and off the quotes junk DNA and therefore you see the different RNAs in different species, different subsets of species. It gets into a whole uh, debate that's going on right now about exactly what is a gene. It used to be thought that a gene codes, codes one protein. And of course then that got kind of stretched because of introns and extrons and uh, alternate splicing and so now you have a gene that can code for 300 different proteins. Um, well, does it, what do you call a gene that codes for RNA, but it doesn't actually produce a protein, but it's necessary for growth? The old-fashioned definition required a protein. Uh, and that's why they would call pseudogenes pseudogenes, because they couldn't produce a protein. Isn't there data consistent with the DNA all being functional and it, there being no junk DNA and therefore some is turned on and some is turned off and, and much regulation, much more than we understand, is going on as opposed to new genes arising in these different uh, fruit flies? Because yes. they're saying that the, this area that quotes wasn't doing anything is now doing something. 
Well, that just may be a matter of fact of your point of view of whether it was functional, was put there on a, for purpose, and when it's appropriate to be turned on, it's turned on. Or it's it's specifically mutated. Uh, one of the theories that's going out uh, going on right now, I believe, from uh, James Shapiro and company, is that uh, what you're actually looking at is uh, mutations that are targeted to help the organism. And they may not be specifically, you know, one to one targeted, but they're targeted enough to where you're more likely to get uh, good mutations than bad ones. Of course, whoever created that uh, uh, so you're implying a regulatory mechanism to guide mutations is, right. is what you're implying then. The fact of the matter is, um, I heard when I was a medical student, I, we had a, 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 a neurologist, um, a neuroscientist, come in and give us a lecture and he said, our study of the brain right now is very much like, uh, like uh, somebody studying a transistor radio without av having any knowledge of what's going on. And uh, the transistor radio is working, so he reaches in, he pulls out this transistor, and the radio goes, hmm, and he says, oh, that must be the anti-hum transistor. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we don't really understand most of what's going on. And for us to try to say that we have all the answers, I think is um, a little bit hubristic. I did notice that an awful lot of statements made could have been qualified as opposed to absolute because it seemed like they were mostly standing on multiple, multiple assumptions. Whereas we would have common, I would think you would say, based on this data, it is felt that a probability of this being true is this and listed your assumptions as opposed to blanket statements that appear to be standing on an awful lot of assumptions. Am I, am I wrong about that? Because there seem no, to be an I, awful I, lot of those. I, I think that uh, this is one of those one of those places where um, the famous phrase we now know um, is being used much more often than is justified. I agree with you. I, I, there's an assumption there, there's an assumption there, there's an assumption there, and then there's the underlying assumption that this must have come up from the bottom because it had to have. It couldn't have been that a really neat fruit fly was created that had all kinds of uh, redundant mechanisms for survival and then some of them get knocked off in this fruit fly and some of them get knocked off in this fruit fly. And, and what you had was protein coating to begin with and then some degeneration afterwards. That assumption, I mean that, that hypothesis is just completely ruled out because if you go with that hypothesis, then you basically have creation de novo or ex nihilo or whatever your favorite phrase is. The transistor radio example you just gave is, is really good and it reminds me in a way of Priestley's flow distance theory. In other words, uh, when you burn an object, it gives off this substance called phlogiston, and the reason the burned object looks the way it does rather than the way it should look is because it doesn't have phlogiston inside of it. Except, of course, that burnt objects weigh more than non-burnt objects. So yes, uh, yes. And eventually we discovered that phlogiston had negative weight. And uh, when you burn phlogiston with dephlogisticated air, you got water. Uh, and 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 the the effort spent to try to save that theory uh, is, is phenomenal, and uh, I think we're looking at you know something that's very similar to that. Why people don't want to graduate from phlogiston to an you know an oxygen type base is. Difficult to, to realize in retrospect, but in prospect, apparently it was a very attractive theory before it was finally had. And it never really, it just kept 
making not good predictions and uh, you know died the proverbial death of a thousand cuts. I said and uh, wonder here about what's going on in the broader context of, <clears throat> we have another example here of uh, scientific literature that uh, is based on untested assumptions or assumptions based on other assumptions based on other assumptions. And how long is the scientific community going to be able to to keep up this game uh, and not uh, be caught at it. Uh, it's uh, so many areas you look into, you, you run into this thing. And uh, I think um, if science wants to regain respect, and it's been losing it you know, in the last two decades, uh, uh, this game has to stop, and some rigor needs to be put into what you're saying. Uh, now, this is now. I wouldn't say that this is a prime example of. Uh, they did try to uh, justify what they were saying and so on, but but uh, somewhere here, you 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 wonder if the bubble isn't going to burst sooner or later here, and that science is um, secular stance and it's a restriction uh, into purely naturalistic interpretations that's going to break down here uh, sooner or later because I don't know how long this can go on uh, and uh, where deep thinking people will, will not say, hey, hey, we've got to get out of this secular box we're in. Well, I think that for many people, there are powerful reasons not to want to get out of the secular box. Because climbing out of the secular box puts you at risk for uh, believing certain things that you really don't want to believe. <coughs> and I think that, uh, I think that, that uh, you know, I, I mean, here's, patently obvious evidence that some things that mathematically shouldn't happen are happening and are happening on a routine basis. And there are predictions that, are, you know, creations have been ridiculed for, well, well, if God created everything individually, why did he use the same genes to create everything? Well, as it turns out, he didn't. But, you know, the people who are using the arguments, I don't think are actually listening to the arguments they're, they're, they're um, using and, and trying to integrate them into some kind of a organic whole. I mean, it's almost as if you're looking at a theological objection in a theological argument, in which case the, the, the facts don't really matter that much. And, you know, I guess if there's, if there's two things I want to say, it is, number one, that, in fact, there's a lot more to this than just the scientific debate. That's number one. That, in fact, there's theological undertones that that if you don't take into account, you're, not, you're going to miss what's going on. And the second one is to say, look, they don't have all the evidence on their side. In any kind of rational argument, this would be prima facie evidence for creation ex nihilo. When you start talking about de novo origination of genes, that's basically what you're talking about. But they don't want to go there. <clears throat> well, what you're describing now, I guess, would be one of, one of the approaches of the scientific community. I think 
scientists out there would fall into one of several groups, one of which is they simply don't want to consider the possibility of creation, and that one of the other groups, I think, was described by a friend of mine who was an evolutionary biologist at UC Davis. And he pointed out that David Lack wrote a book for, for on Darwin's finches, which he's famous for. He said most people don't know that he also wrote a book on theology. David Lack didn't know, he didn't know what to do with, the, evo with the, the evidence for evolution, but he was not willing to give up on God. And my friend said, and there's a lot of David Lacks out there, and I suspect that's true. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you do? How do you challenge it? How do you keep your job and challenge what's going on? I mean, there's, there's a lot of angles there. But sooner or later, I suspect a lot of people are going to come out of the closet. Well, I, I think that this is one of the things, if you, if you read the, the evolutionists who are kind of leading the charge um, against creationism, they're scared. I, I heard a, a, a geologist at, at GSA meeting say that quite, fr quite uh, you know, straightforward. We're going to lose this one, he said. And, uh, and um, I won't argue in terms of what the evidence behind it is, but I will point out to you the sociology involved, and that is that right now, in science, according to one survey, 40% believe in a God who answers prayer. That's not just any old God. That's a God who actually can intervene in nature or perhaps who runs nature the way he wants it or however you want to phrase that theologically. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other 45% the don't believe in such a God. And 15% don't know. Well, see, what happens when 5% of the people who used to not believe now don't know, and 5% of the people who used to don't know now believe? Now you're looking at a plurality who believe. These guys are running on the knife edge. They've been trying to convince the American public in particular for what, 150 years or something like that? Certainly since uh, uh, the 1927 Dayton trial, they've been trying to convince the American public that uh, evolution has it and that, uh, that uh, creation is all wet. And what, is, what have they got for their troubles? There's still 40% of people who believe that mankind originated in the last 10,000 years and God had a and in the process. They're not making headway. Or if they're making headway, it's so marginal as to be not really a, a visible. And so what's happening is they're, they're not making headway with the general public and they're losing their bastion of, of, of science if it starts to move just marginally the other way. And they're scared. You know, from a sociologic standpoint, that's what they're looking at. Now, I agree with you. I think that there are a whole lot of scientists either who do care but don't know what to say or who don't really care and whatever the science majority says they'll go with. Go ahead. Part of it is uh, job security, because yeah. there are, are individuals who have gone from evolution to creation, and they lost their position at a university. Yeah, it's worse than that. There are laboratories who have run samples for somebody and suddenly seen their funding dry up. Yeah, I, I think the I think the problem is, is sociological, actually, more than it is uh, a factual in that. Uh, the Pew Research a couple of years ago, you know, came out with 51% uh, of scientists believe in God or some kind of deity. I mean, you've got the majority here, but the, the present scientific attitude doesn't allow you to express what the majority, albeit a very slight majority, <coughs> 
our scientists believe in. Uh, when somebody the, the, discovers the power of the vote, the whole thing turns over. It, uh, I, I don't know how long this game is going to be able to keep on here, but it, it's interesting to see uh, uh, so many studies uh, say this, but they come back, well, uh, creation is not science. We're, we're scientists. They, they fall back into the materialistic uh, uh, thing and so on. But the, so much of the materialist data points out that God is absolutely essential here. That how long can this game go on? I, I just don't know. When it, in the um, some of the surveys have shown that the those with a higher degree of education uh, in our younger population are more predominantly evolutionist in their view, and I think that shows the profound effect on those trying to get an education on the system's indoctrination. Because I think if you were to take that statistics and look at it based on age and based on how many years of education, we would find a higher percentage in non, in, in areas of science, but that are not necessarily ones that would look at evolution ever. They just would swallow it because that's the environment of the university. That we have a large degree of our young educated that believe in evolution than the general population. So it isn't quite those percentages. And that shows the effect of the indoctrination of our educational system in this country, which also highlights the discouraging part that our own system would have that problem. Well, I think it's one of the reasons why it's important for us to look at the data for ourselves rather than just take uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the standard uh, approach to things because um, I think the standard approach to things has often been massaged mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get out those kind of, uh, shall we say, kinks. And the kinks are really there. Mm -hmm. To put this in context, I was at a meeting of leaders at the university, Loma Linda University, and Dr. Hart said that the issue that came up at La Sierra, meaning creation, evolution, would not come up at Loma Linda. I was so thankful we're safe. <laughs> I just might come at it. Sometimes the argument is made, you know, and it is true. The more educated a person is, in general, the greater proportion, at least of the population, will believe in evolution. But uh, this is no argument in favor of evolution whatsoever because education is dedicated to evolution. And the more you're taught evolution, of course, the more people are going to believe it. It, uh, it's uh, an argument that doesn't, uh, when you look at the real reasons behind it, doesn't carry much weight because what do you expect? Your education is secular. The basic philosophy of education at present is secular. It is not religious. And what you can only expect that the more education you get, the more secular you will tend to become. Okay, we've got one more in a... Unless somebody wants to say something, we'll probably quit after that. Education just, education makes the tyrant more dangerous. That's true. That's true. And um, yeah, I think that there are, there are subtle pressures. It's going to be very interesting to see whether those subtle pressures will shift, and if so, what the end result of that will be. Anyway, next week, come back. We have some more information on, uh, on the uh, finding of uh, various structures in dinosaur uh, bones. Uh, new stuff hot off the press and try to put it in context. I think it'll be interesting.